Hello, this is Alex from Diamond Arm. First off, read this disclaimer carefully. We will look at the FXI iShares China Large Cap ETF. Of course, as of late, China has been a huge topic in the media for obvious reasons. What is especially interesting, really interesting, that's when I looked at the different countries and how their stock markets had performed. You would expect, you know, China to have, you know, the worst performing stock market, but that is actually not the case. Year to date, China on the list I have of 40 stock markets, it's the best performing. I totally did not expect that, so that's it. What you have in front of you is the long, long term picture of the Chinese stock market reflected with, you know, the FXI. We go all the way back here to 2004. Huge rally, big crash during the financial crisis. But then, after that, the Chinese stock market gets weird. Uh, because you can see here that we have been moving sideways for many years. We are stuck in this range, lower part of the range, upper part of the range. We, we've been stuck here for a decade, over a decade in the exact same range. The interesting thing now is that we have fallen to the lower end of that range. This is where we are now. It's historically. Historically, it's been a buying opportunity. Well, of course, there are problems related to the virus. Certainly, that, are, that is bearish for business. The case for the Chinese stock market is that China has a completely different political and economic system. There are obviously problematic issues when it comes to human rights and all of that. However, when it comes to being able to marshal all forces and crack down on a problem, yes, the Chinese system can be ruthlessly efficient. And I think that their ability to handle the virus will be much better than many Western countries. So, let's zoom in a bit here and measure the fall. So if I measure from this high to this low, that's minus 37%. So we, if we zoom out again and look at RSI, you see that historically we usually aren't, you know, that much below that lower end, even during the financial crisis. So you could make an RSI case. Maybe there will be a bit, at least a bit of a bounce. If you have a much more longer term perspective, you, you could make the case that, well, China, it has a very interesting future. So, in this instance, due to the virus, I can get in the Chinese stock market at a, one of the lowest prices we've had in literally a decade. That's an opportunity. If you, you look at statistical correlations here, so this is the correlation between, between the Chinese ETF, stock market, large cap ETF, and the S&P 500. The correlation is a mere 5%. That's nothing. Okay, so basically, there really is no correlation between these two stock markets. That's also a very interesting case. So if you are very concerned about American, the American stock market, that shouldn't statistically influence your opinion here. So, that's, um, so we have, we've had a bit of a look at this one. Uh, let's look now at Yahoo Finance for additional information. So let's look at the 52 week range, 3365. We are now at 36. Upper end uh, is uh, 46-ish uh, dollars. You could make a case, you know, we are definitely at the low end of that range. 
net assets 4.4 billion US dollars. If you look here at the options market, uh, the nice thing here is that um, this ETF is relatively liquid, so we do have a healthy options market. So here are the calls and the puts we'll up here in uh, even five digits here on the volume. Open, it, open interest here, huge. Very impressive numbers. So, if you are into option strategies, huge opportunities here for very flexible uh, strategies. Both when the, the ETF goes up, down, sideways, more volatility, less, you name it. If we go here to ETF.com, it has a B rating. The average spread 0.02%, so very tight. Average daily dollar volume 1.6 billion US dollars. So that's nice and liquid. Number of holdings is 52. So let's look at some of the companies here. So there's uh, predominantly we have financials, technology, and energy. If you look at the top 10 holdings here, you have Tencent, pre pretty famous company, China Mobile. Xiaomi, China, you know, agricultural bank, sports products. So you got, you know, a mix. Uh, quite interesting to see how many businesses actually have China in their name. China, 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 China. Yeah. Uh, let's also look at some uh, mar some mind blowing facts about China's economy from Markets uh, Insider. So China's booming economy means a booming demand for luxury brands and the growing list of billionaires. It's the world's largest exporter. So China imports more US agricultural products than Canada and Mexico. So that's interesting. And that's one of those, you know, big uh, topics uh, Trump is uh, interested in. China is home to a retailer bigger than Walmart and Amazon. You know, that's, you know, Alibaba. A company that we will look at uh, in more detail later. China has the second largest number of billionaires after the US. So, th so this is one of those stories of China is that we've seen this. So even though China it technically is a communist, it's under communism, but uh, what we have seen with communism is that there are many different flavors. So the Chinese flavor is, yeah, let's just say it has its own uh, taste, you know. Uh, yeah, it's they, they are very, very different manifestations. So you, you can't simply look at China as a, being a communist country and have some kind of stereotype in your head. Um, China is its own thing. And there's also been huge changes. Uh, back in the day, it was more uh, typically communist in that the people in the administration were party loyals, but now China has become much more of a technocracy. Uh, but the richest man in China is only the 21st richest person in the world, yes, the CEO of uh, Alibaba, Jack May. Chinese consumers spend 73 billion on luxur luxury goods each year. Of course, luxury products, that's uh, that those kinds of products, they suffer especially uh, during recessions and bear markets because, you know, people cut back on unnecessary costs and frankly buying a Louis Vuitton purse is not like a critical life or death, uh, exp you know, expend expense, you know, it's not necessary. China's export uh, economy grew 954% between 1970 and 2010. That's absolutely humongous. Average whole household income in China has increased by over 400% in 10 years. With a much bigger population, China has fewer poor people than the US. Now that's... yeah, that's very interesting. So the World Bank poverty line globally is uh, an income of $1.90 per day. So... In the US, 12.3% of the population falls below the national poverty line. And that's very interesting. Singles can hire a date for as little as $0.15 an hour in China's growing date rental industry. 
So that's that's one of the cultural aspects of China is that status um, it's very important uh, in Chinese uh, uh, culture. So you do have these kinds of things. Um, there's also people hiring, uh, you know, basically actors uh, to participate in funerals uh, to make them more, you know, sensationalistic. Lunar New Year is the biggest shopping week in China. China recently reopened a legal market in endangered tiger and rhino pots. Yeah, this is one of the huge, of course, controversies uh, about China. China, especially as, as we are. The entire world culture is moving towards a more ecological, environmentalist uh, mindset. And China's um, deep culture of traditional medicine is just in total and utter uh, collision with that. But the pressure concerning that is something that, of course, the Chinese authorities are very aware of. But even though, you know, it's a communist country, authoritarian uh, regime, they are... it's very... it's difficult for them to then go down and change the entire culture. Uh, because they have to be very careful, because if they go very hard on change, that can create opposition. Obviously. So that's one of the reasons why this change has been slower than one would hope. So, that's some facts about China. Another interesting caveat, uh, interesting fact I have found is that uh, that concerns uh, genetics, uh, uh, you know, genetic engineering, gene editing. China is investing huge into that. They basically have adopted um, a eugenics program. So this communist country, you know, communism, has adopted a eugenics program. Um, of course, you can think whatever you want about that. The thing is that we have seen what eugenics can do to um, plants and animals of different types. It is very likely that it will, ha it will have the same effect on humans. So with a continuous push um, from top down to increase the intelligence of the average Chinese, yeah, that will be very bullish as well for China. So, to, to wrap up, for the long term, I am bullish on China. Yes, there are very ominous signs about the global economy. We could very well be heading full bar into a global re recession due to the uh, virus, because it is shutting down all kinds of businesses. It will likely take many months for it for you know it to, to sort of have done its thing you know re reach the peak spread and then flatten out it's one of the countries that will be more able to handle it will actually be china so that's going to be extremely interesting to see we could very very well face a future where america is partly crippled by the virus while china has been able through ruthless efficiency, flatten the curve, and be open for business. Whatever you do, of course, you want to let the trend be your friend, and be especially careful in these times, which is, which is why it is very great that there is an, a very liquid options market for this ETF.